Hey there, this is Dan. You're watching this Alt-EC, and I am proud to give you my most cursed thumbnail of all time. I love this art, but uh, it wasn't working with any background, and uh, this is not a high enough production value uh, joint for me to fix it or hire someone to teach me how to do thumbnails. What I'm actually hoping to do today is to talk with folks about some of the stats that I think are wrong. Uh, now, when I look at win rates of different factions in Warcry, I'm looking at what actually happens in tournaments. And so because these stats describe real games with real people, we can never actually describe sort of the platonic ideal win rate of a faction. We can only ever describe the way that people play those factions. And so that creates a lot of situations where I don't think that the overall power level of a faction is equal to the win rate. Um, and that can happen a few different ways. One is people can be playing it wrong. <laughs> um, the other is sometimes people just aren't playing it. The worst factions in the game don't even get onto the faction win rate tables because we have 60 factions and people just don't play the ones that are unplayably bad. So for example, I think Chaos Legionnaires, there's nothing that I could, I could do a video on how to play Chaos Legionnaires every single week for you know the rest of the rest of this channel and i would never ever get them up into the mid 50s i would never get people playing them and people winning with them in tons of tournaments i would never make the meta because they're so bad but uh there's still a ton of factions that are worse than chaos legionnaires but you just don't see them because people don't play them uh the other thing though there are factions that people are just kind of playing wrong and that's what I want to dedicate this video to. Uh, Iron Golems, Gloomspite Gits, and Jade Obelisk in particular uh, have, I think, a lot to go on that is pretty exciting that I think people aren't necessarily getting the full benefit out of when they bring them to tournaments. And so I think we should dive into it. The first is going to be Iron Golems. And the stats on Iron Golems are actually really robust. Sometimes a faction has a wonky win rate because the stats are just weird. So for example, on stats, one of the highest win rate factions in the game is Demons of Slanesh, but uh, half of their games are just one person. And so what does that mean really? I mean, there's a lot of things we could talk about there, but it's not necessarily the most robust statistics, right? Iron Golems, that's not true. There have been 23 players who have taken Iron Golems to tournaments, uh, and or sorry, 23 tournament entries with them, but 20 unique different players playing Iron Golems. And as kind of a pattern emerging is there's just a low win rate across a wide variety of players. Um, the win rate now is actually even lower than it was when I made this slide, which I can talk about later. It's not too big a deal. Um, but the win rate now is even lower than it was uh, here. And part of that is there are some traps here with Iron Golems. Uh, one is the specialists. All of the specialists seem okay. The Armiter, the Prefector, the Signifer, the Drillmaster, all of them are okay on their own. None of them are bad, bad. But you just don't have room if you're going to try to tune up Iron Golems to try to you know make them really effective on the board. You don't have room to play all of them. And part of the reason for that is that Iron Golems just don't have great abilities. Um, the abilities in general are just quite poor. And so a lot of what makes specialists good in the factions with good specialists is, yes, you are playing something really middle of the road. There's a lot of stuff in Warcry that discourages playing middle of the road fighters. Um, I guess the really quick Cliff Notes version of it is an activation has value, so even a you know, one wound, no attacks, one inch move fighter would be worth some points uh, just because doing anything at all has value. So cheap fighters are good. And then um, abilities and divine blessings and things tend to be force multipliers, which means that 
high value activations are also really good. So really big fighters are also really good. So Warcry does tend to push you towards the smalls and the talls as far as what you want to be running if you want to be really effective on the board. Um, and so middle of the road fighters have to have really good abilities to justify their existence. And some of them do. Some factions have that. But in Iron Golems, they don't. And so, you know, you do have sort of a fair point for point uh, look here on some of them. So, for example, Drill Master kind of does some stuff that nothing else in Iron Golems does. Um, Armator is actually pretty points efficient, even though it's very middle of the road. Uh, same is true of Prefector. I think Signifer is awful, but, um, you know, some people want... <laughs> well, that's one of the traps, but it's not the worst even even if you are taking it for that ability that I don't think is very good. Um, none of these are awful, and if I see one of them in a list, I'm not going to look sideways at the person, right? But if you have all four, I think you're in a tough spot. Even if you have three, uh, I think that that's a bit of a trap, right, that you don't, you don't want to end up there. Uh, the truth in the faction is uh, they have two things that are amazing, and the first is... Toughness 5, Survivable Chaff. And you can see here this Iron Legionnaire with the shield painted by Houston Toad. Uh, one of my patrons, thank you so much to my Patreon. I always forget to say things like, give this video a like, consider subscribing, consider joining the Patreon. I never remember to do those things. Uh, I wish I did all the time because I love the community that I've got in my Patreon. Um, so please consider joining. I'll have a link at the bottom of the screen. And thank you so much to Houston Toad for uh, supplying this awesome warband here to look at. But this guy with the sweet shield uh, is very, very good. Toughness 5 on cheap models lets you do a lot of things um, that certain warbands just like can't really answer very well. And so having at least three of those is I think really key. Um, the one with the bolus and the one with the twin hammers, those are the other sculpts for Iron Legionaries. Um, they are, again, with Iron Golems, the, the game is always none of their profiles are embarrassing on their own, but they don't like build to something. Um, something that happens with the Toughness 5 all across the board thing that you can do with iron golems is you can have fighters on your opponent's side who are meant to get kills who just don't have a single target in your warband that they can actually fight profitably and um so having the bolus having the twin hammers even though they do cool things um they can give your opponent out so they can give your opponent something to do to just hunt them down and that way they can still salvage their points cost on some of their uh, fighters who need to be fighting but don't necessarily cut down on uh, toughness five all that well the second thing that's amazing in iron golems is plus one attack on the ogre breacher and there's a few reasons for this one is uh it's just a big boy uh anything with a four eight damage profile and i think it's got like toughness five too or sorry strength five too i know it has toughness five um anything with that big damage profile is going to scale really nicely with plus one attack. Uh, plus one attack, I would say, should be more like 45 points on these big, sort of big damage fighters. Um, and so since you're paying 30 points for something that should be 45, 50, uh, you're getting a ton of value there and it makes them really powerful. It also combines really nicely with the Iron Golem's battle trait, which turns... Um, all kinds of roles. Basically, you get to turn one role into a six. So you can use uh, the Drill Master whip ability on sixes for triples. You can use um, any of your doubles on a six. But the ones that the one that's actually good is if you just hold out for Rampage. A lot of the time, you'll get like three twos, and you'll in regular Warcry, you'll get three twos, and you'll think like, man, if like, I still feel like I need to go get a Rampage here, but what am I going to get with Rampage 2s? Iron Golems always Rampage on 6, which means that having a really good Rampager is super important, and that's where having the plus 1 attack Breacher is just ridiculous. It's 250 points because it's the 220 points plus the 30, but any round in which you roll a Rampage, you get to do absolutely 
devastating stuff to your opponent. And that's a really wonderful place to be. And it does make Iron Golems a bit of a roulette wheel, but those plus one attack reachers are good anyway, so that's fine. Um, I think that's kind of what you want to be focusing on. We can just quick look at uh, sort of the the whole history of people bringing them to events. You do see people kind of going with a lot of pure Iron Golems. And then, of course, the Thricefold Discord is there. Uh, Iron Golems, I love them. They are single-handedly keeping the Thricefold Discord win rate uh, from looking scary, which is kind of funny. Um, but you will see there's, you know, people trying them as just pure with the battle trait, and I think that that's a pretty interesting thing to try uh, going forward. Um, so just like looking at some examples of Iron Golem's lists that haven't worked, I don't want to, I'm not going to identify any of the people running these lists. Uh, I don't want to bully anyone by just showing a unsuccessful list. Um, for for this group, I kind of took out the, the person running them. Uh, sure, you could look it up if you wanted to, but um, the point here isn't to embarrass anyone for running anything that I don't think is powerful. The point is just to, I just want to point out some things that I don't think are necessarily good ideas to uh, bring to a tournament if you aren't bringing it because you think it's cool, right? So for example, um, this list on the left has an unblessed Vexmore, which is wild. Uh, in general, Vexmore is this fighter. He's got uh, one attack, but it's strength 10 and it's 510 damage. And it is not very good when you're only rolling one dice, but when you bless it, you get a second dice, you double your damage output for only 30 points. And it's a ridiculous amount of damage at that point uh, for just 180. It's generally thought of as a requirement to bless it, but this uh, list doesn't have room for a plus one attack blessing, and it has both Vexmore and the Ogre Breacher, and it's got Lassavir, and so that's kind of a tough spot, but you're also looking at, you know, a Legionary with Bolas, um, an Armiter. I actually really think Armiters are good, but... Um, I think you want to be like spamming them for the meme list. And then it's one of those crazy meme lists that can actually kind of catch people by surprise. Um, and the other person who I've got here who uh, didn't do very well also has an Armiter. This is just one box. It's hard to blame anyone for going to a tournament and not doing well with one box. Again, this isn't anyone's fault. Um, the issue is just like when you just play one box, you end up with, um, you know, a lot of things that, you don't necessarily want to be in that spot, right? So you have a, an Iron Legionary without the shield, you have a Signifer, you have um, the Armiter and the Drill Master. Again, both of those are okay on their own, but only if you're sort of building them as part of a plan. Um, so it's just, it's tough when you're kind of going in different directions and you're giving your opponents lots of toughness for things that they can try to take out. Um, that's kind of not where you want to be with Iron Golems. A couple things that worked well. Um, one of them, uh, this list on the left did win a tournament uh, without any of us realizing that uh, he was running about 1,150 points. Um, so it's he had plus one attack blessings on the Ogre Breachers. Uh, the tournament had kind of a complicated list building structure. So please don't blame this player. I know you could look up who this was um, based on like, you know, combing through tournaments on war tally please don't uh it's not his fault i'm like 90 percent sure that he thought that you got your outlaw for free uh the drill master here is 140 points if you subtract 140 points from the thing it, the blessings work out perfectly so i'm pretty sure that's what he was thinking um so this list is illegal uh but it has everything you want i mean of course it does right but it has everything you want from iron golems uh he was running um, two plus one attack blessed Ogre Breachers. He had just one specialist, which I think is where you want to be generally, is just only having one specialist. Um, and then he just had the shield Iron Legionaries, just the ones that are toughness five. So there was no soft target in his list um, other than his outlaw, which was specifically there for story reasons because it was sort of a semi-competitive, semi-narrative tournament um, where you got bonus points for this sort of outlaw side quest. Um, I think that's really powerful. Now, obviously, uh, you can't run this list, but uh, I think that that's it's just like a really smart wish list of what you wish you could run, right? Um, another list that did fairly well uh, was 
Uh, this one here with two breachers and room to bless one of them with plus one attack. Then this person was running a signifer. Again, I don't think the signifer is good, but that's okay. You have room for one um, one specialist in Iron Golems. And so whatever you want to pick as your specialist is fine by me, right? Um, so it fit plus one attacks on whichever Ogre Breacher you need. So you can just, whatever's on the field round one, you can give it a plus one attack blessing. Um, and that puts you in a really powerful spot. Again, this person is running three Iron Legionaries and none of the ones without a shield. So you just don't have any soft targets. Um, I think that's really how you want to be using iron golems and running them to have a little bit more success than i think people are generally having with them now i think this is absolutely a warband that you can that you can tune up and do really well with um it's just hard it's there's a lot of traps you don't have good abilities and you have really difficult decisions about whether or not you want to take the battle trait or bringing bring in an ally in theory you don't really get much from like a lot of classic ally selections because your ogre breacher already does what a lot of allies would do um so that kind of pushes you towards the battle trait but then again you have that issue where none of your abilities except for rampage sixes are good right so it's a difficult list building faction but it can be done and i think that this list on the right is a really good start and anything with a plus one attack ogre breacher and at least three Iron Legionaries with shields and no Iron Legionaries without shields. Um, I think anything along those lines is going to put you in a pretty nice space and going to do okay um, and just be a lot easier to run. Uh, I also I also really do think that the like four or five Armiter meme, meme list is good. Uh, I'll just never be able to prove it because I'll never have that many Armiters. All right, Gloom Spike Gits is another one where I think they're a lot more powerful than the current stats would uh, indicate. The stats on Gloom Spike Gits are pretty robust. There's 18 players, 18 unique players uh, bringing Gloom Spike Gits to tournaments. I do find it funny that nobody has brought Gloom Spite and then brought them again. Uh, <laughs> that can Maybe that tells you something about them being frustrating to play, or maybe it's just random. I don't know. Uh, but there hasn't been anybody since uh, Peter Merson Cabbage put Gloom Spite down who has really like made it their business to sort of dive into Gloom Spite and have that be their like signature faction. Um, of those players, they have achieved 24 wins and 38 losses. So it's a pretty consistently low win rate. It's not total disaster because one thing that is really interesting with Gloom Spite is that I only found one winless entry uh, in the history of people playing Gloom Spite Gits, which I think is fascinating. So even though as a group, I mean, you see basically nobody i don't think so only one person has had a winning record with gloom spike gets um there's been well okay uh two one and one is also a winning record but very few sort of positive records with gloom spike gets um almost entirely losing records with them but only the one winless which I think is fascinating. So there is stuff you can do here. There are things, you know, you're not going to just uh, completely bomb out, or at least people haven't been with Gloom Spite, um, even though there's a lot of meme lists in that, in that cluster. And this is part of what I mean by the data describes the people. Uh, a lot of people who bring Gloom Spite gets do tend to meme a little bit. Uh, and there are some things that look like they will be... Uh, interesting to meme with um that can be so difficult to play as being uh, a little bit frustrating so some of the traps anything that crawls around so all the spider riders all the like little squiggy beasts um except for one of them uh are all kind of traps i think all the foot slogging combat pieces are traps and people have figured that one out i don't see people running like the um the guy with the moon helmet, for example. I can't remember his name, but I don't see people running, trying to make that work, stuff like that. Um, and then a lot of the underworld stuff is somewhat of a trap. Um, there are a lot of like little bits and pieces of Zarbag's Gits. Like Zarbag's Gits has 
uh, a whole thousand points in it, um, and only two of those fighters are good, but you see a lot of them get played sometimes. Uh, same with the, was it Grinkrax Loon Court, I believe. Uh, has a couple pretty good fighters, but you see all of them get played sometimes. Um, the truth with this faction is Molog, Molog, Molog since the last FAQ. I think Molog is insane now. So he got dropped like 40 points or something ridiculous. Um, I actually kind of don't like Molog's shtick as, as a model, as a meme. Uh, but as a set of stats and abilities, he is insane. That triple is wild because it doesn't end at the end of the round, which is ridiculous. So you can uh, just... Round one, you just drop it down no matter what, and you just own part of the board. Uh, one real flaw with like minus one attack bubbles, any kind of team fight bubble, is that if you don't win initiative, your opponent can always just like outflank you and, and actually make it so you wasted resources setting up the bubble. Um, but with Molog, that's just not true because after you've put it down, no amount of initiative. Uh, messing around by your opponent is going to actually get them out of that bind if that's the part of the table they care about, which is wild. Uh, they also do have, uh, Gloomspite are kind of famously points inefficient on their fighters, partly because they have so many wild abilities, but they do have some fighters that do things uh, point for point. So like Snufflers are just perfectly durable uh, with the 12 wounds. Uh, netters, of course, have a very good ability, so it's kind of okay that they're so fragile. Uh, everything in the Gobblepalooza is pretty reasonable. Um, yes, the Bruget got knocked down 20 points, but it's still pretty playable where it is. It used to just like completely dominate competitive Warcry, so the fact that it's 20 points more expensive now just makes it like a reasonable solid include that you play if it fits your list instead of being you know completely dominant it's still playable um pretty much all of the gobblepalooza is playable i think uh, i think maybe there's a couple of them that i wouldn't use but like boggle eyes are really good scaremongers are decent um i think that's the one that reduces your opponent's attacks if it's not, that's the one that's also pretty solid. Um, there's a few of them that are good, and they all have those 12 wounds or more, so that's a really good spot to be, um, especially with Gloomspite being just like really fragile in some of their pieces. It's nice to have some that uh, can actually take a little bit of a hit. Then uh, the other truth is Underworlds. Uh, Snurk and Snorbo in particular. Snorbo has a big movement buff, which can be really useful. Uh, Snurk can just do a ton of damage if you can manage to keep him alive. Uh, so there's just there's a lot to like in Gloom Spike Gits. It's just that there's so much not to like that I think it kind of gets people into traps. So let's look at a couple things that are not working. Again, please don't try to look these lists up. I'm not trying to bully anybody. Uh, the first one... You've got two squigs. That's kind of a tough spot to be in. Um, anytime you kind of... Basically, I just don't think Cave Squig is very good. Uh, it's like just good enough to make you think it'll be funny to run a few of them. Uh, and then it'll kind of put you in a in a bit of a rough spot. The other thing that this list has is Rock Gut Trogoth. I don't have it prepped for this video, but in my last meta video, uh, if you went to the allies section, you would have seen uh, there's only a couple allies that are really popular that have uh, below 500 win rates. For the most part, people bringing in allies are gravitating to allies that are pretty good, uh, and the, the ones that are pretty good are getting a lot of play. The Raka Trogoth has, like, lists with Raka Trogoths in them are significantly below 50% win rate. And that's not just Gloom Spike Gits, that's like all of Destruction. And something that unites both of these lists is having Squigs and having Rock Gut Trogoths. And I do think a Rock Gut Trogoth can be a fine use of 185 points if you're not necessarily leaning on it to do a ton of work. Um, but unfortunately, I think both of these lists really are. And so that's not a place you want to be if you can avoid it. Uh, you know, especially if you're like blessing it with plus one crit. Again, the person on the right here, I think, is living their absolute best life. They went with six squigs, uh, two rock guts, and a fungoid cave shaman. They were clearly doing like this was obviously a real like master's thesis on how to roll up to a tournament to have a good time, right? Um, so 
I totally respect that. But if you are trying to kind of uh, <laughs> lose friends and make enemies with all of your wins, uh, you're going to want to avoid really leaning on Rocket Tragas the way that this list is doing it. Uh, a couple things that do work well, though, is if you have Sneaky Snufflers and Molog. So this list on the left um, did pretty well in a TTS league. I got to play against it with my Skaven, and it was a pretty difficult game. Um, Molog is just really impressive, uh, even though in our game he was coming on in round two. Sneaky Snufflers are just, I think, the chaff that you should be running in Gloom Spike Gits. Um, and this list on the left lets you keep the battle trait. I think the battle trait is a little iffy personally, but it's really sweet when it works. <laughs> um, when you get to like, I had a rampage on fives turned into threes, which was pretty impactful. Um, you can do a lot of cool stuff with that that I think is good. The other thing that this list on the left here has is prog and snurk. So it's got like the good underworld stuff that I think is pretty solid. And so that's, I think, a pretty solid place to be. Um, a Gloom Spike gets list that I have played and tested with. I haven't brought this to a tournament yet, but I've thought it was pretty solid uh, when I tested it. Is Molog the Mighty, Morgok, Thug, two Sneaky Snufflers, and then a bunch of Netters. Basically Prague, a regular Netter, and then the Bogolai. Uh, it's pretty similar to that list on the left. Um, even though I actually don't think I knew about this list when I started testing um, my version, but I think we came to the same conclusion that you really want Molog and at least a couple Snufflers. Um, and then I basically traded, I decided I didn't really need the battle trait. And so I brought in some Iron Jaws to have some staying power. That can be a thing that Gloom Spike gets kind of struggles with is just being able to stay on the board. And Morgok especially can just like run up into a crowd and expect to live. And that's just such such an important thing. And then Molog kind of creates a theme for that too, because you get to uh, do that defensive bubble. And so now kind of Morgok plus Molog plus Thug having 25 wounds for only 140 points, 25 wounds on toughness five, um, just lets you get up in your opponent's face and just stay there. And they can't get you off the board, um, which protects your fragile little netters who can then go protect your big guys by messing up their big guys, right? So it's a it's a whole control symphony I'm trying to make. I don't know. I don't think anybody playing against it would feel like they're experiencing a th symphony, but it is like, it's a full control idea and it works pretty well. Um, and I think that anyone could take this list uh, that I made and, and do pretty well with it if they have that kind of control mindset. And it's, it's not necessarily like counter spell control. People think of control as like blue based magic control, right? Of just like you're stopping your opponent from doing stuff. And this is more, um, it's a, uh, <laughs> for the real magic nerds here, there have occasionally been uh, like white black kind of staxy controls or like attrition control lists where um, you just like you have a ton of board wipes and then blah, blah, blah. Who cares about the magic references? All I'm saying is um, this is a just like attrition type of list where you are just reducing your abil your opponent's ability to kill stuff and you are presenting stuff that's hard to kill and seeing if they can survive it. And um, I think that that's a pretty fun play style. I like when a list has like a true play style it's trying to achieve. Um, and it's also just got a lot of good fighters who are good on their own, which I think is an important thing to have when you're kind of trying to succeed in Warcry. So that's how I would play Gloom Spike Gits. But if you do want the battle trait, I would suggest trying out the list on the left here um, because that's a really good uh, starting point too. Either way, whatever you do, if you want to win with Gits, play Molog, play at least two Sneaky Snufflers. I think that that's like, that is the base <laughs> in my opinion. Uh, then we are going to get to Jade Obelisk. Uh, Jade Obelisk is kind of a funny one. So this is where the stats are just not very robust. There's been seven entries. Uh, it's got like just over 20 games played. Um, so 25 games, I think. Uh, seven wins, 18 losses. But normally, so 25 games is not very many games. It's a small sample size. But normally I wouldn't be that concerned about it if it was seven unique players. 
but here we've only got four unique players and two of the entries were actually a tournament director staff botting. So that's like very, very misleading about what this warband can actually do. Uh, and that's a place where like generally when people say like, oh, you can't trust stats because the sample size is low. I generally, that's usually a hint to me that they don't know what they're talking about and I can ignore them. Uh, but there are like very specific times when uh, you can just like understand that the stats don't mean anything. And Jade Obelisk is that time. Uh, but they are a hard faction to do. And of course, five of the entries were not a TO staff botting, right? And those players also kind of struggled. So I thought it was worth uh, sort of unpacking kind of the broad strokes of what you're supposed to do with Jade Obelisk. Um, War Games on Toast also has a video on Jade Obelisk that uh, you should check out. The traps to me are defacers and the bird. I think the bird is terrible. I know some people like the bird. I think it's awful. Uh, the I've played it. I've played Jade Obelisk quite a bit too. Um, the defacers are the move four guys. They basically do nothing. Uh, and then desecrators are funny. Where if you have all desecrators, that's a tough place to be because there's a lot of warbands, especially in the competitive scene where they actually don't struggle at all to deal 12 damage in one hit. So anything on 4-8, like an Orc Mega Boss, um, anything like the, the Varen Guard is an absolute nightmare to defacers. So it can just be tough n to avoid getting one shot taken off the board with them. But they are really good. They have the most efficient damage output in the game. Their double just blows things off the board. Um, and sorry, I'm talking about Desecrators, not Defacers. I think I said Defacers there, but uh, they have this high risk, high reward play style where if all you have is Desecrators out there, uh, you're going to be in trouble. But if you have like three or four, you can really leverage them as long as you put them in safe places and don't get them attacked with no reprisal right away. So that's why I kind of have them under traps and the truth here. Uh, the other truth is Obelisk Bearers. And by the way, Look at the Flav of Flav bling on these two obelisk bearers. Uh, Avery Winden painted these. Uh, he does commissions, by the way. Um, they are so sweet. I think that the, <laughs> I think that these things are so sweet. The little necklaces, um, they're so cool. And then the other thing is, the last two warbands I wasn't necessarily talking specifically about allies, but I really think that because I hate the bird, I think the bird's awful. Um, I really think that. These guys benefit from having fast allies in a big way and can be a really wonderful home if you've got like a, a piece that you really enjoy. Um, I'm not going to talk much about like any specific warbands that aren't working because there's only a couple specific people playing Jade Obelisk right now. Um, but let's talk about these profiles of some of the allies that I think are really solid. So like the Enlightened Aviarch on Disc of Zinch is a really on theme ally for Jade Obelisk. That's what I play on mine. Um, the Varengard works really well. Um, Bloodkinds are really good out of Beast of Chaos for this because uh, it's a perfect synergy. So they have this double that gives them a bonus move in round one. So even though they're only move five, they're not the fastest thing in the world. Uh, you can put them so that in the treasure mission you're going to have to play or you know any situation like that where you look at an event pack and see that a couple of the missions require speed a couple of them don't you can make sure that your blood kind is on round one and then you can just have all the speed in the world at your fingertips in round one when you need it and then after that you just have a really solid combat piece um, for 245 points 5525 five, is a fine place to be and then 235 points for the Great Axe is not very good, but for 265, that's amazing. Because um, then you get the fourth attack, 4538 is just a really scary profile to have to play against. Um, and so I think that the Blood Kine uh, with the Great Axe is really good when it's getting blessed. Um, a couple lists that aren't working. Uh, one of them is One Box. I don't want to ever blame someone for bringing one box, but I will just note that uh, one box with Jade Obelisk really puts you in a terrible situation if you want to win your games because of all the defacers that are in there. Um, the other one is 
a list that didn't do very well, but I think is so freaking cool I had to talk about it, is Centaurian Marshall and a Raptorix. Oh my god, incredible. Uh, <laughs> obviously, the Centaurian Marshall has had its struggles in Warcry, um, so, you know, this list obviously didn't win very much, but uh, is so cool. And listen, there's more to Warcry than winning, and bringing a Centaurian Marshal and the bird in your Jade Obelisk Warband, is, uh, that's winning in a different way. All right, so let's go to what I think really works with them. Uh, one is just, again, oh my god, the Flavor Flav necklace on the Obelisk Bear. So sweet. So my formula uh, that I play with them is just a Neferite Priestess, I actually think she's kind of decent. She's got 20 wounds for only 105 points. Uh, there are other factions that would just play that as their regular fighter. Um, she's kind of your other fast piece, even though she only has move four. Move four is all you need sometimes with speed. Um, but then I usually have six of the actual fighty pieces. And how I do the balance. I mean, I only own two obelisk bearers, so that's how I do the balance. But when I'm actually brewing about what can work, um, I do the balance by just what I want my ally to be. So for example, I play two obelisk bearers, four desecrators, and then an AV arc on disc for 245 points, or 275 points, sorry. Uh, you could have all desecrators and have a 295 point ally, although I don't suggest that, um, because I think you really want to put your obelisk bearers in front of your desecrators in your deployment groups. Um, then you could go like almost all obelisk bearers and have a much cheaper one. Like you could have five obelisk bearers and one desecrator and have for 245 points, the blood kind with two little axes that has five, five, two, five. Um, you can kind of like mix and match those based on what size ally you want to bring in. And I just think that the Bloodkind with Great Axe is the best one available. So that's where I would go, and I would have three Obelisk Bearers and three Desecrators, and then that ridiculous 4, 5, 3, 8 uh, attack profile on the Bloodkind, being able to give it that uh, double for a bonus move when it matters, and then having the three Obelisk Bearers to just have some staying power in every single deployment group is really powerful. Something that's kind of off the wall uh, <laughs> and much less tested. Uh, I've tested this list, or at least the one with the AV arc on disc, um, before the last meta watch. People were playing lists very similar to this and doing quite well with Jade Obelisk. This is tried and true. The one that's labeled my formula, the top list here, you can bring this to any tournament and um, expect to put yourself in a position to succeed. The one with rats here, I'm making no guarantees, but I think it's really sweet. Um, Neferite Priestess, Scabic Plague Seeker, Rabidius Skench, two Obelisk Bearers, and four Desecrators. Uh, this gives you two little rats with their move six, which is what you need. Scabic has uh, just been very successful in tournaments, um, just in general. I mean, you've got that uh, really... He had a couple really crazy abilities, and Scabic and Rabidius can both do the objective bombing where and treasure bombing where you just select a an objective or a treasure to be gross now and then everyone every opponent within three inches of it uh just has to like take a damage check uh like you get to roll and if you get a three up you get to deal damage to them and so if there's as long as there's three enemy fighters within the point that you're selecting it's a really good damage rate um, and really powerful and that's just on a double which is crazy they also have a triple where scabic can uh like give rabidius and scabic both an attack or both a move something like that uh, and you can actually do it where scabic gets two moves or scabic gets two attacks so Lots of cool tricks that you can do with Scabic and Rabidius. Um, and then normally I think having a bunch of these little move six guys can put you in a place where you kind of get killed a lot. But you've got your staying power with your Obelisk Bearers and your pure damage with your Desecrators. And that's going to make it so that you can win battles once they get created. Um, and so then, you know, Scabic and Rabidius can focus on just like grabbing the gold, earning you points, things like that that are important. Uh, this is kind of a wild out there list, but I think it would be really cool and I, I think it would be really fun to play. So that is three factions that I think are significantly better than the stats would uh, 
tell you. I think obviously each one for different reasons, but um, I think it's fun to kind of take the stats of what we've seen in the game and look deeper into them. So I'll try a few more videos along those lines, but um, until then, may all your rolls be crits.